Hey everyone, welcome back to the 4Play channel, I'm Jays, and in today's video I'm going to be teaching you about the history of swinging. So normally I do have Bella here with me for these videos, but this one I'm actually going to be filming by myself. I do have her on my shirt here though, and so that way, you know, she's here in spirit. But yeah, I'm going to teach you guys the history of swinging today, and I do want to preface this. So. I went through and I did all the research I could. I tried to gather as many facts and kind of cross-reference things. But the truth is, there is so many different things out there because swinging for so long has been secretive, right? And all of non-monogamy has kind of been that way throughout history. So there is a lot of things that I'm going to talk about that are people's, you know, accounts or speculations. And so I basically just tried to cross-reference everything as good as I could. And so just know, taste with a grain of salt, some of these facts could be a little bit off, but I did the best to make sure that it was as factual as I can make it. But just keep that in mind when I'm kind of teaching through all of this. I want to talk about kind of ancient civilizations. There's no really history of swing back then, but there is just some non-monogamy back then. And so we'll talk about that first because the real first swinging started around the 1940s, so we'll get there. So we're gonna go back to ancient civilizations. Also, you'll notice me reading off this iPad sometimes just because I want to make sure that I am reading these facts correctly. So that's why you kind of see me looking down. It's just so I can read everything correctly. We're actually gonna start in ancient Rome. And so monogamous relationships what were legal in ancient Rome, but supposedly there was a lot of men who had relationships outside of their actual marriage. And as long as it wasn't harming the family, this was kind of accepted in society and people knew about this. So it doesn't seem like super ethical non-monogamy to me, but it is a form of non-monogamy that's been going on since ancient Rome, which is forever ago. So in some of like the Hindu epics, like some of the texts, like the Mahabharata, there was polygamy and polyamory that was going on. Pauti, sorry if I said that incorrectly, was one of the main character and supposedly she was married to five different brothers. Lord Krishna, which is also in the Hindu text, also had multiple wives. Also historically in lots of places in India, non-monogamy had been practiced. It was basically kings who would have multiple wives. So another one of those same kind of things, but still it is non-monogamy. So it's interesting just to know that that's been going on for such a long time. There are also as many places in Africa that had polygamy as well. And that's kind of how they structured some of their culture just to help with resources and things like that. Polygamy is still practiced in some places in Africa. Along with other places, polygamy is still practiced some places. I know it's not near as common as it was at different points. An example of that is the Maasai tribe in Kenya and Tanzania. I said they had practiced polygamy. It said the system help them distribute labor and resources that ensure sustainability of their pastoral lifestyle. So I said, it seems like the idea of non-monogamy has been around for a long time. Some of that seems more ethical than others, but I think it's just interesting to know in general that that has been going on, you know, since ancient Roman times. But now we're going to jump into the 1940s. And this is when we first kind of get the idea of swinging started. The first records and kind of stories about this is in the 1940s in the Air Force. And so I couldn't find the exact reason of how it got started or why, but what, from what I read and kind of research was, I guess a lot of these Air Force bases were kind of in more remote areas. A lot of time them and their wives were in the same housing as other husbands and wives and with families. And so these men would go back on these large missions and you know, sometimes there was things that you, you didn't know if your husband was going to come home. But after World War II, I guess it just kind of created this whole sense of community and togetherness. From what I read, it seemed like it kind of went both ways. It seemed like sometimes maybe one of the husbands would go away and while those wives were sad and at home, you know, the other husband would be with the other wives. And that seemed to be kind of some sort of way to cope with the husbands being gone for a long time, but those husbands knew about it. There's also some stories and kind of reports that sometimes those couples would do things together. There was some things called like couple swapping or wife swapping. And so, so those details aren't super clear, but it seems like that's the area where swinging started was that 1940s in the Air Force. So here's kind of an example of, I think what they were trying to help with their feelings of those people being away for so long. It said the prolonged separation created emotional and physical needs that swinging helped to fulfill, providing a means for both partners to find companionship and intimacy while maintaining their primary relationships. 
Another thing, however, based on the available historical accounts and social dynamics of the time, it appears that both forms of partner swapping together and separate were practiced, but the exact prevalence of each was hard to determine. So now we are going to jump to the 1960s. This is where the sexual revolution happened, and this is where a lot of things start to escalate and get more and more as we go through time. Said so key factors contributing to this change include the development and widespread availability of contraceptives like birth control, which gave individuals more control over their reproductive choices and sexual lives. It also had 1960s. 60s, this is where key parties started to come around. So if you've heard us talk on this channel, I've never been able to find a lot of proof about key parties. We've had comments of people who said they went to them. There's random stories online of people who said they went to them. So I do think that key parties happen from time to time. I do think they're more a push from like the Hollywood movie mainstream media type thing to push this narrative like what swinging is oh it's key parties it's an idea so there is there's, there is stories of people who said they've been to them but they definitely weren't like crazy prevalent or anything but it is interesting that's kind of where the story about key parties started and so it seems like there may be a little bit of truth to it but i don't think it's quite as heavy as like the mainstream media made it seem like it was. So also this time, books and movies began to reflect the influence of public perception of swinging. For example, the White Swappers provided an inside look into the swinging lifestyle and movies like Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice in 1969 portrayed swinging in mainstream media. So like I said, you can go back and see where these things kind of started to become more in mainstream media. And it's so hard to determine because mainstream media and what swinging actually is aren't always exactly parallel. Yes, there's truths to it and realities to it, but a lot of it is kind of not exactly how things really happen, but interesting to see those books starting to come around and movies like that starting to come around in the late 1960s. So 1970s roll around and we start to get even more things. We start to get our first lifestyle clubs or kind of like a sex slash swingers club started in the 1970s. One of the first major mainstream sex slash swingers clubs in the US was Plato's Retreat in New York. It opened in 1977 and gained notoriety because celebrities, adult film stars, and also well-to-do couples started to attend. Also, the North American Swing Club Association, NASCA, was formed for these clubs and offered a network of resources so these clubs could all kind of grow together, which I think is really cool that you had that sense of community back then trying to have a thing that kind of let all these things prosper, especially because it was so new at the time. You had print media played a crucial role in connecting the swinging community. Magazines like The Swinger offered advice, personal ads, and stories of the community. And like some of these newsletters allowed swingers to start communicating for the first time, being able to really find other partners. And these kind of led to some ways of people being able to find partners. I've heard a lot of stories and it looks like from the research, some of these things, it said there was ads. I think that you could also even, you know, put out ads in these magazines. I've heard also have in phone books, couldn't really find if that's actually true or not but you could put out ads looking for other swingers. So there was ways to find people and that's kind of where all this finding other swingers seemed to start. So I know this still has problems to today, but you also started to see where some swingers clubs because it is stigmatized that they had trouble. There was legal issues. I know there was raids at these places to get them shut down. And so it's just been kind of a struggle for the swinging community to be more normalized. But obviously with swingers club starting and it not being super normal, that's when these things started to happen. We're gonna jump to the 1980s now. And this is where the HIV and AIDS epidemic kind of really was very prevalent. And this did alter a lot of different things in the sexual space. One thing that happened was with this, it really promoted the importance of protection and sexual health and taking care of that. It impacted the community, leading to a heightened focus of safe sex practices and regular testing. Education about STIs became a priority. Many swingers clubs and online platforms provided resources to information on health and safety, encouraging responsible behavior and use of protection. So because of that whole epidemic that was going on. I said, I just brought more awareness to sexual health and wellness, which has rolled on into today. And I said, if you've ever heard us talk how important taking care of your sexual health is, and not saying that people were not using protection before then or anything like that. It just said it made it much more prevalent, made much more knowledge get out there. So people had more education about this so they could do a better job taking care of their sexual health. So 1990s roll around and we start to have some things pop up on the internet. And that's where I feel like it really starts to revolutionize things. You had websites like SLS and Adult Friend Finder that provided platforms that you could find swingers discreetly. So, you know, a little bit better than running an ad in a magazine. It was a little bit more discreet online. These online places had 
chat rooms and forums and listings of local parties like they do now. I said it was much not near as sophisticated as it is now, but there was starting to see where you had these places online where you could find local people around you, make connections, be discreet. And I think that really helped a lot more people get into the swinging lifestyle because they weren't as worried about getting outed and possibly losing a job or something like that. Also in the 1990s, we saw a huge rise of swingers clubs in big cities, you know, even smaller towns. And so you start to see more and more swingers clubs, which allow more and more people to go out and make these friendships, make these connections, and get more involved in the swinging lifestyle. Many clubs offered theme events, private parties, and special nights catering to different preferences and demographics, making the lifestyle more accessible and diverse. I love this. I love the diversity of the lifestyle and it keeps seeming like it's getting more and more broad. The more different kinds of people we can have in this lifestyle, the absolute better. So it's nice that the club started to do those themes and stuff even way back then to be able to kind of grow the community. Also in the late 1990s, books about swinging, both fictional and non-fiction, gained popularity. I was like the ethical slut offered insight into consensual non-monogamy, emphasizing communication ethical considerations. And if you guys have not read that book, I would highly recommend it. It's a great book if you are in the swinging lifestyle, if you're poly, if you're open, if you have any sort of e and type relationship, it's a really good book. It helps you get better understanding of ways to communicate. It also helped me learn about the poly community just so I could have a better understanding of how they worked. And it's just a really good book. There has been kind of like an updated-ish version. It's still not the newest. I would highly recommend reading that book for anyone who is in an open relationship because it's just a lot of good knowledge, not just to learn and help you grow, but just to learn about other people in your community. So in the 2000s now, the early 2000s, we see a boom in these dating sites. You see a lot more sophistication in them. They're starting to have more different features, which makes it easier for people to find other people. So the internet was getting more popular at this time. And so obviously the more popular it is, you're gonna have more people on there. And so the internet really was a huge catalyst into getting more people involved in the lifestyle. At this point, you know, you really started to have, be having these better dating profiles where people could, you know, see your pictures, start to get to know you a little bit better, have better communication online while still being discreet. So those websites just kept getting Bigger. That SLS, Adult Friend Finder, were the ones who were still kind of leading the way, but you saw you had other sites that also started coming about this time. So you kind of had even a larger array. And if you know much about like swinger lifestyle sites, they kind of vary from region to region. If you guys do want to know like the local clubs near you and what dating websites are popular, you can download our newbie guide right down here. I'll put the link. But if you download that, um, there's a link in there that takes you to all of the different clubs that are in America that we could find as well as all the different popular dating websites by region. Also, if you use those links in there, you can get a free trial membership. So you can try those out. But a lot of those websites are kind of regional. So you had more things popping up. So it just got a bigger network of people all over. Also at that time, you had some conventions that were starting. Not even Nolan's an example of that. They've been going on for I think this is their 26th year. So, I mean, you can do the math back there, late 90s, early 2000s, and these conventions and more parties, events, things like that just kept taking off at this time. In the late 2000s, you had social media starting to change, Facebook especially. And if you know, the swing community is huge on Facebook. There are so many different groups for so many different swinger things on Facebook. And so as Facebook and just that kind of social media started to become popular, there also started to be growth in the swinger communities in those spaces. And so Facebook kind of also helped revolutionize that in the late 2000s. So we're getting close to present day now, but we're gonna go to the 2010s. You had more and more social media websites kind of rising, having some popularity. Anytime there's one of those things, there is gonna be some sort of presence of swingers on there, finding their own community. You also had Playboy doing things like the show Swing. Um, that was an amazing show that basically took people that were interested in the lifestyle, took them to a house with other people who were swingers, and they were able to kind of get to talk to people, learn about it, sometimes they had experience, they had a coach there that would help guide people through, and it was just an amazing show. Me and Bella watched that when we first got into the swinging lifestyle, and that was in 2014, um, and so we used to watch that show, and so there was just things like that becoming more, and I know Playboy isn't really like mainstream media, but more so than a lot of things, and so you had things like that, that were kind of coming out and helping people as well. And then you go into those late 2010s, the early 2020s, and that's when social media became even more on different platforms. And then that's when you started to see people starting to create content about the swinging lifestyle. And that's when we started creating social media content almost four years ago. And that's also really changed how the swinging lifestyle has gone. I really do believe that social media has been such a game changer in such a good way for the swinging lifestyle. I think it's brought it to even more 
people's eyes. I think that apps like, you know, YouTube and TikTok and places where people can do research and find out about communities that maybe they didn't know about and have these for you pages that show you stuff that maybe you didn't know about. I think it's brought more awareness. I think also it's been able to teach us that, you know, swingers aren't all just these old people. We're all kinds of people, all different sorts of demographics and everyone is welcome. I think social media has also been able to provide that. And so now that's kind of where we are in today's society. Swinging is a lot more normalized. It is still extremely stigmatized. It's still not accepted completely, but I will say it's becoming more normalized. There are some places in like cities that have laws now that you cannot discriminate against swingers. And so there's places and people who are trying to push towards the normalization, like we are ourselves, trying to make it more normalized because it is a healthy relationship structure. So it's not for everyone. We don't think there's an ultimate goal of everyone should be a swinger. That is definitely not how it is. It works for some people. It doesn't work for some people. That is totally okay. But it is one of those things that we'd love if it was a little bit less stigmatized. We just want people not to have to worry about losing a job because they're ethically non-monogamous. It doesn't affect your ability to be a good parent or to do a job or anything like that. That's why we continue to push for the normalization of this lifestyle because it's been so beneficial to us. And so yeah, that's kind of the history of swinging. Like I said, I really am sorry if any of those facts are not 100% accurate. I tried to cross-reference things and find things the best I could, but because it's been so secretive, because it's been so hard, it's hard to know if everything is 100% factual. So I just did the absolute best I could, but I hope you guys enjoyed that. I really enjoyed doing the research for this video and kind of learning about the lifestyle and how it got started because I didn't know that much about it. So it was super fun for me to do that research as well. So I really hope you guys liked this video. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe to never stream, post a video. And if you guys have anything that, you know, maybe I missed or there's something that you heard about how swinging evolved or things, please drop that down in the comments so other people can learn as well as me because I would like to learn more about little facts of how it got started or maybe if any of you have been in the swinging lifestyle for a really long time and you're seeing this video, maybe there's things that you lived through that I've never seen. So drop that down below. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Bella will be back in the next one. But yeah, thank you guys for watching. I'll talk to you in the next one. Bye.